From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. Since January, eight reputed mobsters and associates from Rhode Island have been charged in a federal crackdown on organized crime. The biggest pinch, the reputed longtime former boss, Luigi Baby Shacks Minocchio. Also busted alleged capo regime, Edward Eddie Leto. In a separate case, notorious and admitted mob captain, Anthony the Saint Saint Laurent, bought himself seven more years in prison for trying to hire hitmen to gun down this man, his arch nemesis and high-ranking wise guy, Robert Bobby DeLuca. The gangland slaying on DeLuca may never have been pulled off, but he has been missing, and his absence has raised questions about whether he is cooperating with authorities. All told, the ranks of Rhode Island's La Cosa Nostra are thin. The Providence Organized Crime Task Force has shattered Omerta, the New England LCN's code of silence. Has law enforcement put the final nail in the underworld coffin? Our guests for the first half of this special edition of Newsmakers, Rhode Island State Police Colonel Stephen O'Donnell and Deputy Attorney General Gerald Coyne. Then, even before the vacuum of power in Rhode Island, there was a seismic shift in the New England mob, sending the balance of power back to Boston. Law enforcement sources have identified Peter Lamoni as the next dawn of the Patriarca crime family. Joining us on the second half of Newsmakers, veteran organized crime reporter for the Boston Globe, Shelley Murphy. Good morning. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Joining me on the panel this week for our special edition of Newsmakers from the Providence Journal. You know his byline as W. Zachary Malinowski, but in the trenches we refer to him as Bill. Bill, good morning. Colonel, right. Jerry, thank you very much for joining us on the program today. Um, I want to dive right in and start off with the question that I raised in, in the top of the program there. One question that Bill and I get asked a lot from viewers, from readers, is, uh, you know, who's left, right? Uh, so, Jerry, has 2011 essentially made La Cosa Nostra extinct in Rhode Island? I would never say that La Cosa Nostra is extinct. Uh, law enforcement has been very successful in investigating and charging some people who have been longtime top echelon members, but I would never say it's extinct. Colonel, the one thing we didn't mention there is that the state police had a big hand in that federal investigation, along with the Providence Police Department and the FBI. There's an organized crime task force, but um, <laughs> there are also state charges pending against Eddie Leto and others, and it's, uh, if they walk away, these defendants walk away from the federal case, it's almost like you guys are waiting in the wings like a, a legal grim reaper. You know, has, has the fat lady sung in your eyes for, for the New England mob? I mean, how many made members of La Cosa Nostra in Rhode Island are there left? Um, there's several. We believe there's at least eight still pending that are out there um, that are made active members. I think what people need to understand is that they, they joined an organization that swears allegiance to do criminal activity and kill people. Um, we go back for historic years where they've killed or they haven't been charged with the murder. That murder's been adjudicated, but they ordered those hits. So for as long as they remain alive, law enforcement and prosecutors will pursue them. So what, what hits are we talking about that are still mob cold cases that you're raising here that might still be on the radar screen of law enforcement? And I don't mean tucked in a box in the back corner of the state police in Citroën. I mean ones that are maybe being actively looked at right now either by the feds or by the state police? Well, I can't get into anything active and any cold cases we work on, but you can talk about historic things where uh, we discussed this week the George Basmajian homicide. Well, we caught the people who did it. They sure. went to jail for it, and um, one has died and one is recently released from prison, but somebody ordered that hit. It's an orchestrated package that gets put together, and you only need to go look at what's been publicized about Woody Bulger, that you can never sit back and let them um, intolerate that behavior. You have victims that need to have closure. Now, I, I had a question. I, I wrote a story about it a couple weeks ago, and Tim alluded to it in the intro about Bobby DeLuca. Uh, he's missing or disappeared. I don't know if we can say he's missing because I'm not sure anybody's really looking for him. <laughs> but if he is, in fact, cooperating, could he, I mean, how damaging is the information that he could provide to investigators, such as the Kevin Hanrahan murders unsolved, Barry Compotis is unsolved from the late 80s, are these areas that you believe that he would be asked about, seeing he's been a high-ranking mobster in the patriarchal crime family? Uh, again, as we talked about, as for Mr. Dluker, um, you know, we we're talking about things that may be happening, may not be happening. Um, we're aware that um, 
the news articles that Bobby Luke is missing and out there. So uh, we have no concern about Mr. Luke, what he's doing, what he's not doing. But he would know what was going on within the family um, at a pretty high level, correct? Well, I think some of that is speculation. I think, though, that when you look at, you know, the, the war on organized crime, it has historically been built on cooperating witnesses who law enforcement has convinced to cooperate with authorities. So um, I, I wouldn't speculate about any one individual, but that has been part and parcel of the success that we've achieved over the years. You know, Jerry, the, uh, I, I asked the colonel here how many made members there are left on the street. Um, I think there's a misconception that 20 years ago, there was a, a ton of made guys in Rhode Island. Hasn't it always been uh, sort of the ranks are thin in Rhode Island, even just historically? I think the numbers have always been dramatically smaller than what the public has assumed. Um, you know, making, being made in organized crime was historically being made like partner in a major law firm. Um, many people were what we called associates, but very, very few were ever actually made. So I don't think the number has dropped off as significantly as people think. It, it, it was never that, that large. Do we, do, do do we, you, you guys also, but talk about you, an associate can do as much or maybe more damage than a made guy, correct? I mean, if a made guy has a crew of eight or ten people, the associates may be trying to become a made guy, so they're pretty active. I mean, they can do a lot of damage. Well, being labeled as an associate doesn't mean that you're being labeled as a nonviolent person. Right. So, but, you know, the, the question, I guess, in that arena is, do we know the last time they opened their books? The federal indictment talked about Albino Focarelli being inducted in 1996. Do we have any idea the last time a made member in New England was, was inducted? We, we probably do from source information for nothing that we could put down is accurate. Let's talk about Luigi Minacchio here. Um, I wrote a piece this week um, about several people writing letters of support for the reputed former boss. So he's trying to get out of bail now after a, uh, get out on bail after a superseding indictment. One of them was from a filmmaker, filmmaker uh, Michael Carrenti. Uh, he said he's consulted with Minacchio and he had trouble on a film project in the past. He's visited uh, Minacchio at the Wyatt Detention Center in Central Falls. And he points out, along with other letters submitted uh, to the federal court, that this guy's a gentleman, he's kind, uh, that he absolutely shocked and could never think of uh, him extorting anybody or threatening violence. What about this perception, Colonel, of the, the gentleman mobster? How accurate is that? It depends on your definition of gentleman. Uh, Mr. Minacchio went to jail for murder. so. I wouldn't call anybody who's convicted of murder as being a gentleman. So because he comports himself in a manner that is professional um, on the streets where someone may perceive him as a, I'm a gentleman because he'll speak to you and have a conversation with you, um, these are people that decided to put people to death because they didn't agree with their ideological thinking. So um, I wouldn't characterize him as a gentleman. What would you say to Michael Carrenti? I think it's an incredibly naive view of the world. Um, I think people should recognize that the criminal justice system and the jails are full of people who neighbors and friends never saw that side of the person. So for him to come forward and say that this, he's a, a kind, a, a gentle person, I think is an incredibly naive view of the world. I, I think Colonel O'Donnell brings up a good point also. I mean, he was involved in a double murder in a market. I think, it, I believe it was in 1968. He was a fugitive for over a decade. Went on the run, right. And, um, and I've spoken to many troopers and the state police will say he's always polite, you know, he never loses his temper, he's, he will chat with the troopers, but, I mean, look, look at the, his background, his history there. And also, you don't become the head of organized crime if you're just polite to people. And By a nice being guy. a nice guy. Right. 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 Um, I, you know, I often uh, joke <laughs> that a lot of uh, the way that the mob made their money is now legalized. You can gamble. We can go down to uh, we can go to Twin River. We can go down to Connecticut. Uh, access to loans is a lot easier. So, what are they doing now to remain active? How are they making money? They're still involved in the illegal gambling. I think we've talked about that in the past, where it's money on credit. So, and, and then the loaning money at exorbitant interest rates, where if you don't pay, the issues you have to deal with that. That creates other crime you can't pay the debt then you have to refinance your mortgage or you become a thief at work and you embezzle funds they're also into prescription drugs anything that is that doesn't take a lot of law enforcement attention or the easy route they take they're also involved in large amounts of um, um, narcotics trafficking because there's a large, large amount of money in it we've been reporting a lot more and you brought up prescription drugs um, 
it seems to me that there's been more busts involved uh, ox in OxyContin selling these pills uh, on the street. Is this a new avenue for the Cosa Nostra in, in Rhode Island? I mean, I think uh, what we have Buckles Malisi was picked up for that, right. and then uh, the Decatur Social Club up on Federal Hill was rated for it, that. It seems like they often get caught with OxyContin, and, and I've been told that they resell pills for $100 a pop. $100 a pill? That's, that's a moneymaker. Well, I echo the Colonel's comments that organized crime is going to historically be, is going to drift towards any way of making money. They can and many of it is huh. illegal. Um, if today we're talking about prescription drugs, tomorrow we may be talking about some new way. Um, they've changed with the times, but it's definitely going on. Bill says they can adapt, but to adapt you need people to do it. So in New York, you look at the five families, and though they've been decimated by the RICO statute, federal RICO statute and law enforcement down there, they're still uh, moving forward. They have a bench there. They're still ethnic Italian-American uh, neighborhoods uh, in New York. Is there a bench in Rhode Island? Is there any young blood that either exists or even wants to join uh, this faction, Jerry? Well, I hesitate to call it a bench. I think that there's still a glamour associated with organized crime. A that, glamour. Did you yes. see the video of uh, Anthony the Saint Saint Laurent in the beginning? I mean, do you think, honestly, as an advertisement, is that glamorous to young people? No, it's not. But I think you know, as long as shows like The Sopranos keep you know running, and as long as people, you know, not so much the news, but the entertainment side of the media, um, historically, I think has glamorized it to a level that's just not real. So. Um, in reality, if you showed the real mob, you'd be showing a very different world. Weigh in on that, Colonel. Um, organized crime that we see at traditional La Costa Nostra is about power and money. There's no question those are the two driving factors. So if it's the power that um, allure of it. I grew up in the neighborhoods where it was there, where people were connected to other people. People love that. And that's, that's just not a Rhode Island thing. That's a New York national thing. I know this guy, I know that guy. Um, and as for the money, as we've seen, some of the things they've been indicted for recently are shakedowns of $5,000. So you might perceive it to be a $500,000 shakedown. Um, those are the ones that sometimes at low-lying fruit get caught. You have a mob boss now making collections from somebody on the street. That was unheard of 30 years. You also have prosecutions. Um, it, it shouldn't be missed here that you'll see as you, put it, you announce this as a federal prosecution, but this is really, it's a ground-driven state prosecution connected to the federal government, where we have FBI agents, state troopers, state prosecutors, state uh, federal prosecutors working in conjunction. You have a historical perspective to bring these cases to fruition. I, I have a question, too. Let's say that with these recent uh, indictments and arrests, most of the mob power structure in Rhode Island is gone. Do you guys keep a close eye on what New York may do? I mean, could they send people up here? Because, as you said, it's about power and money. If there's a power vacuum here, there's money to be made. Is it conceivable they could come up and try to uh, make some inroads? It's really a good question because what happens is when we've put the members of La Costa Nostra nationally in prison, where do they go? They go to federal prison. With guys well, from New York. Exactly. Right. They become friends with and connected well with wise guys from other parts of the country. Uh, we know that factually from surveillances. We know it from prisons. We know it from some of the wise guys. So there's always that potential. Um, I think Boston this is really interesting in going back for 35 years from my memory that you have the power shift boss and underboss out of Boston. That's highly unusual right. for the balance of power. That's the message in itself to Rhode Island. And, and I'm curious what you think about the, the kind of intelligence that you have uh, out of Boston, out of Massachusetts, the reputed boss, Peter Lamoni. There's been some questions about who the underboss is. Do you think even the wise guys know who's the top guy sometimes? There is confusion even in the underworld. Do we have any idea? Does law enforcement in Rhode Island, are they identifying who's who to put you on the spot? Yes, I think um, it's a great point because there is some confusion with them. Even when Louis was the boss, Louis Menachie was alleged to be the boss here, it was a power struggle that clearly was going on. Any time you take out a boss, um, we may differ that Peter Lamoni would be the boss because Peter Lamoni, with the prosecutions he's facing, that you have um, Carmine D'Annunzio, who was the boss, he went to jail, typically go to jail, they remove that, and we have Anthony D'Annunzio as a player up there. So there's a whole um, plethora of wise guys trying to take over in Boston. 
Well, we, we do have to uh, go to a break right now. We're going to talk about Boston with Shelley Murphy in a moment. But uh, 30 seconds left, Jerry. Final question. He asked about, uh, we worried about New York coming up. We worried about Boston coming down because, as Bill points out, the sad fact is people want to gamble. People want drugs still and want easy access to money. Um, any outside traditional LCN, any evidence or concern uh, that other factions might be coming in? You hear in other parts of the country about the Russian mob and uh, other things like that. Have we seen any of that here yet? I think that, you know, so long as there are these opportunities to do things illegally, to make money illegally, we would be very naive to focus exclusively on the traditional La Cosa Nostra. All right. Uh, Jerry Coyne, uh, Deputy Attorney General for Rhode Island, and Colonel Stephen O'Donnell, thank you for joining us. And when we come back, an organized crime roundtable with Bill Malinowski, myself, and Shelley Murphy from the Boston Globe. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Joining me here to my right is Bill Malinowski from the Boston Globe, and no. we're delighted to have uh, Shelley Mur uh, excuse me, from the Providence Journal. Uh, we're delighted to have Shelley Murphy from the Boston Globe. Uh, Shelley, uh, you and uh, reporter Maria Kramer uh, wrote a great piece, an authoritative piece on Whitey Bulger, where he's been on the lamps um, for the past, well, since 1994, right, since he was indicted. Um, and if you didn't read it, you have to go to boston.com or bostonglobe.com, as they have two sites now, buy a subscription. Um, the biggest and most controversial headline out of that was the Boston Globe named the tipster who led authorities to Bulger in Santa Monica, California. Channel 12 reporting on that. Uh, we have opted not to name that person. Quite frankly, we don't know here at WPRI what the Boston Globe knew. What were the conversations in the Globe newsroom leading up to the decision to identify the tipster? Well, I mean, there were a lot of conversations about whether to identify her. And I think, uh, uh, obviously, um, we thought about her safety and whether or not that would be an issue. Um, knowing what we know um, about Whitey Bulger, we know that you know once he was exposed publicly in 1997 as a longtime FBI informant who not only gave up his rivals in the mafia but also gave information on his own gang, that really he had no friends in the underworld. That um, all of those who are involved with him in crime have, you know, they're either cooperating. Some of them have written books. Some of them are in jail. Some of them have died. Um, but many witnesses who cooperated against him are walking around Boston and. Have have been for a long time without any reprisal. So uh, that was the first issue. Secondly, um, we, we feel pretty strongly that Whitey Bulger knew the identity of this woman. That, you know, Why within, is that? well, within two days of his arrest, it had been reported, widely reported, that the tip had come from a woman in Iceland who used to live across the street from them or right in that neighborhood in Santa Monica where they were hiding out Whitey and his girlfriend. So um, we talked to neighbors. We got the name from neighbors. We went to California. We interviewed a lot of people in the Santa Monica neighborhood where they were hiding out who said there was one woman from Iceland who lived across the street from them for a time and then in an apartment, you know, a couple blocks away and, and told us this phenomenal story about this stray cat that every morning and late in the afternoon, Whitey and his girlfriend would come out and they would feed this stray cat. And this woman from Iceland bonded with them over this cat, struck up conversations with his girlfriend and thought what a lovely, kind woman she was. So it was, you know, while she was back in Iceland watching um, a CNN report where she saw their photos flash across and said, wow, those are my neighbors in Santa Monica. So, um, and, and the most important thing I hear, I think here is, Clearly, there's a privacy issue that uh, the FBI did not want this woman's identity released. Sure. We, we understand that. The FBI promised her confidentiality, and I think the FBI kept that promise, and they did not release the name. But for us as news reporters, you know, we know that there has been probably no story in the Boston area that has created as, much, um, cons as many conspiracy theories as the Whitey story. The idea that you have a longtime FBI informant who is warned by a corrupt retired agent to go on the run. Now in prison. Now in prison, convicted of murder. Sure. Uh, so he's hiding out for all these years. There have been, you know, a worldwide hunt, millions of dollars spent trying to find him. Meanwhile, the public perception that the FBI isn't really trying to find mm. him because there's been so much corruption, you know, being exposed through civil and criminal proceedings. They finally find him. He's hiding out in one place for 13 years. 
with lots of people around there from Boston. I'm getting calls from people saying, was he in an FBI safe house? I mean, mm -hmm. is this real? Uh, we don't believe it. And, it. and it was an incredulous bit of news when it came out that the tip came from Iceland. CZC, do you think that the investigators knew that he was there? No, I, I don't think there's don't. any evidence of that. And what our story was meant to do is be a answer a lot of questions that the public had. How could he be hiding in one place for so right. long? It, can we believe this, that it was some woman from Iceland? Who, how did she hear about it? So I think that, you know, when we went out there and interviewed a lot of people in the neighborhood, it suddenly became very clear to us how he could be in hiding for so long. When you hear about how they lived, I mean, he was pretty much holed up in the apartment. Right. I mean, he, he had the, the windows shades covered with yeah, shades right. drawn, right. very rarely out. When he did come out, he had the hat pulled down right to his eyebrows. People that knew him out there didn't even realize he was bald. I mean, I don't think he looked like we would have, you know, in, in a way that made him easily recognizable. Mm. Um, I, I want to dive back into LCN, if you will, away from Bulger for a moment. And uh, Bill, I'll throw this one to you. You you did a great report on Robert DeLuca, questions swirling about his absence, and you heard the colonel there. We're not worried about his uh, his absence. So, you know, the word is on the street, and we always have to be careful with that, but uh, that he may be uh, cooperating with authorities. Um, you ask them the question, I'll ask you the same one. I mean, what kind of cards could this man hold for, uh, for law enforcement? You know, I, I know the colonel and Jerry Coyne were reluctant to get into specifics, but I'm, I'm certain that he could give up some murders. Mm -hmm. um, you know, possibly the Kevin Henry and murder, possibly the Barry Compartis murder in the late 80s. He was found in Beaver Tail. I think he was shot seven times and set on fire. Um, in Jamestown, both unsolved mob, I think they're the two last unsolved mob murders in Rhode Island. And just based on, you know, DeLuca being a made guy, being in Rhode Island, he would have been, you know, one of the guys calling the shots here. I would think that he would have knowledge of those murders. So I think there's reason for everybody in Rhode Island to be concerned about this. Is he, Shelley, is, is DeLuca now, as you pointed out in the first half, when you go to prison, sometimes these are school you know, these are schools for uh, these right. guys, and they, they make strong ties to New York. In, in uh, DeLuca's case, he made strong ties to Boston. Uh, he knew Cadillac Frank Salami before prison, spent some time with him in prison, and some a others there. A lot of there, time. A lot of time. Uh, is he on the Boston radar uh, as far as a major player in, in LCN, or is this a uniquely Rhode Island thing? Uh, I mean, I... You know, I think Bobby DeLuca's name is known in Boston because he was, you know, part of that infamous 1989 mafia induction ceremony that were, you know, and of course he sat through those long hearings in Boston with Frank Salemi when they sort of, you know, exposed Whitey as an informant. But in terms of, you know, what's happening in the LCN today in Boston, I think the focus has been obviously on the Carmen D'Annunzio case, the Mark Rossetti case, you know, more of the cases that have been at the forefront there. Let's talk about those two cases uh, briefly. One thing that stuck out to me about uh, Anthony, the Big Cheese D'Annunzio, as he's known. The Carmen? Uh, uh, excuse me, Carmen, the Big Cheese D'Annunzio. Thank you. He went, um, he got into trouble for trying to uh, bribe his way into a big dig contract, to sum it up. Um, and he, he solicited someone who he thought was a, a state employee, but was actually, um, was actually someone working undercover, law enforcement undercover, and that was his ticket to prison. But what does it say to you that an underboss, or a reputed underboss, I should say, or at least a high-ranking member of LCN is actually doing the legwork himself? What does that say about the state of the mob? Yeah, I think what it really says is just the diminishing, you know, the, the, it's a little bit reckless. I don't think you would have seen that back in the days of Patriarca and Julo, um, Nikki Bianco. I think right. that it, it's shown a real sort of um, recklessness that, that he's not, that he wouldn't have been insulated. The idea that you have a mob underboss on tape saying, I'm the boss, or I'm the, you know, at yeah. least in Boston, um, and would to, you know, in, in dealing with an undercover FBI agent was, was pretty startling, definitely. I have a question, just being in Boston, uh, what do you think the perception is of Rhode Island and Providence by the mobsters who are now in charge in Boston. Well, all from. Is it, go ahead. Sorry, it, I didn't mean no. to cut you off. Um, I think that if you go back, even you know, to like say the the days of Angelo, it seems that the power has sort of shifted back and forth. Right. Um, and that um, you know, it does seem now that the power has shifted back to Boston. Obviously, I mean, mm -hmm. it's been reported in, in court filings in the Monocchio case, but I think that um, it, even in, in Boston, though. 
there are a few people left that are made members from, from my understanding that, that, that I would say that the New England mob is at an all-time low in terms of power. Mm -hmm. But it also seems kind of hard to believe that like New York organized crime will just kind of let New England sit there and nobody's going to take it over. It's just too big. There's too many people live here. There's, you know, the mob has been part of the scene for a hundred years. And we have 30 seconds. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I think that there still, um, there still are made members. There still are people in the New England mob in Boston that are doing what they always did. You know, right. there's gambling, there's loan shocking, there's drugs. We've seen evidence of that in some of the recent indictments. So I just think that there are less of them and they're less organized, more disorganized. And, and there was a case recently of a New York uh, uh, made member from a, one of the five families down there coming to Massachusetts, and, and he was picked up there. Right. So maybe they are reaching out. We're actually going to continue this conversation because we're out of time, but certainly not out of stuff to talk about. So go to our website, WPRI.com. We're going to continue this organized crime, uh, organized crime roundtable. It's under Newsmakers. You'll find it in the on-air section at the top of our homepage. I want to thank our guests this week, especially Bill Malinowski from the Providence Journal and Shelley Murphy from the Boston Globe. We will see you next week on Newsmakers. Um. Welcome to WPRI.com. This is a special uh, extension, if you will, of Newsmakers. We're talking about organized crime. I'm Tim White. To my right is Bill Malinowski from the Providence Journal, and we welcome down from Boston, from the Boston Globe, Shelley Murphy. Uh, before we dive back into LCN, we had touched a little bit on Whitey Bulger, and uh, Bulger actually sort of, I wouldn't say made his bones, but he has some connections to Rhode Island. You did a piece on that. Yeah, he, he was in his early 20s, and I think it was in 1955, him and two other guys were involved in a bank robbery in, um, on Central Avenue in Pawtucket, a really brazen bank robbery. And um, it turned out that they were involved in bank robberies in Pennsylvania and Indiana, and one of the guys was caught in Indiana and he gave up Bulger and somebody else. And um, I think Bulger got somewhere around eight or ten years and he was sent to Alcatraz. He was one of the last prisoners to serve time in Alcatraz. Mm -hmm. And he underwent some experiments with LSD and other drugs. The government gave him the drugs to see how he would react to it. And in exchange for that, he got some of the prison time reduced. LSD and Alcatraz. Right. That is uh, he, it was another prison that they actually gave him the LSD. But, oh, was it? But he did serve time in Alcatraz. Right. I, th yeah. I think he served yeah. several years there. Shelley, there's a name that I, uh, I want to bring up here. It's a uh, uniquely Boston name, but it might have ripple effects into some cases here. You had broken a story in a guy named Mark Rossetti. Who is he? Well, Mark Rossetti is a, a capo, a, a reputed capo, according to court, uh, court documents in the New England mob, uh, viewed as a suspect in six murders, according to law enforcement sources. And, um, but it came out after he was indicted in a state case on gambling, loan shocking, and heroin trafficking that he had been on FBI informant also. Mm. So that uh, revelation, it was revealed that by... That must put up a red flag for someone who covered uh, John Conley and, and Whitey Bulger for so yeah, long. Yeah, I mean, the, the FBI has come under some criticism for that. And um, this, it, this is a state police case against Mark Rossetti. And it was defense lawyers who learned, you know, through the court process that he was an informant and have, are now trying to use that to get the case dismissed. The, um, any indication that... Uh, Mark Rossetti's um, cooperation with the FBI is playing a role, and the answer could be no, but is playing a role uh, in this massive bust that took in Luigi Minacchio, Eddie Leto, the high-ranking mobsters from, from Rhode Island. Do we have any sign that he is he's part and parcel to, to this case, either of you? I don't know, other than there was a mark that came up at a bail hearing a couple of weeks ago in court, but they didn't identify the last name. And my other question is, maybe Shelley knows this, is whether Rossetti did have close ties to the Rhode Island mobsters. Well, Rossetti is aligned with Frank Salemi at one point. He, he definitely has Rhode Island connections. I think, um, you know, what's important to say is that when he was indicted, well, first of all, when he was um, being, he was, there was a bugging operation, you know, they had his phone tapped, and the state police realized because of the tap, they overheard a conversation with his FBI handler. They went to the FBI, told the FBI, and the FBI, was asked to, to not like drop him immediately as an informant so that they would he wouldn't become suspicious so you know the FBI was poised to drop him and then 
continued to keep him on just so that he wouldn't know that he was being targeted. Uh, so at the end of this, um, they dro you know, he was dropped when he was arrested. Um, but I think now that it's been exposed, you know, that he was an, an FBI informant, he has to be worrying about his future. Yeah, and if where, there was, where is he now? Yeah. He's in jail. Yes. He's in jail awaiting trial. And I, but I would think that uh, if he wasn't cooperating before, that things may have changed, you know, with the revelation that he's an informant. I would think he'd now be worrying about, you know, whether to switch sides, frankly. Mm -hmm. The uh, name we brought up earlier in the program, Peter Lamoni, uh, you know, about a year and a half ago after reports of Luigi Minacchio stepping down, he was feeling the heat and, uh, from a federal investigation. Uh, law enforcement was looking at Peter Lamoni as a boss. He then got into some trouble in Massachusetts, so there are questions now about what his role is, if any. Uh, in the New England crime family, but he's got a pretty interesting history. Who is Peter Lamoni? Well, he's got a very interesting history. I mean, he spent, um, you know, 33 years in prison for a murder that he wasn't involved in. I mean, there was a, or that he was wrongfully convicted. It was a 1965 murder. It was a, uh, at the time, you know, the FBI, you know, there was, there was a suggestion that this was a mob sanctioned murder and you remember Barboza sure. uh, Joseph the animal Barboza yeah. he was the witness okay. who sent Peter and you know five other men um, to prison and, and, it, and there were documents FBI documents that remained secret for years that finally came out um, were uncovered as part of the whole Bulger scandal um, that revealed that um, that there was testimony that indicated that some of these men were framed that Peter and, and three others were framed. Two of them died in prison, um, and one of them was Tamilio from Rhode right. Island. Sure. And um, and so w when a judge, you know, overturned that conviction in 2001 against Peter, Peter walked free um, and won this huge lawsuit against the government. You know, was awarded 26 million dollars um, that he had lost. To, he spent most of his life in prison. Um, then after he was out, the there was a new case brought against him by the state, state police, right yes, now. the state case, saying that as soon as he was released, that he immediately began a loan shocking operation. And he did plead guilty a year ago. And um, I know he's been identified in court documents here in Rhode Island as the, um, you know, as the, you know, re reputed, reputed boss, boss sure. right? But I think that um, his situation changed a year ago. He pled guilty and he was placed on probation for five years and he's currently on an electronic bracelet. So, and there's a list of about 53 guys from Reputed mobsters, so you know, associate associates right. from Boston and Rhode Island that he's been ordered to stay away from. But I think he has sort of this um, mythical status up in Boston because he's the guy who spent all those years in, in prison and then walked away with $26 million. And a multimillionaire now. And that just begs the question, we we'll probably won't have the answer for it, but you hear guys like uh, Colonel O'Donnell always say that when they get out of prison, they look for their piece of the pie back, right? right. And here is a quintessential example of that. This guy is rich. And he right. comes out and gets involved, uh, it, allegedly at this point still, I don't think that's been wrapped up, correct me if I'm oh, wrong. Oh, no, he pled guilty. He did plead, okay, he pled so guilty and he, he gets was, wrapped and he up. was sentenced to probation. Lunch yes. He's got plenty of money to put so, on the street. But I think he didn't have the money yet. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> the, the, you know, the award, you know, by the time he was awarded the money, I think it was 08, and then, mm. you know, by the time he got it, there were appeals. Um, I'm not saying that that, you know, but he wasn't walking around with $26 million right. in his pocket when he was charged with launch. And now they'll go to legal bills. It's, I want to talk about the FBI bill. About four years ago, I did a story on a guy named Jeffrey Sillette. He is the yeah. supervisory special agent for the, uh, uh, for the FBI and the New England Organized Crime Task Force. In that report, I wrote about how Jeff um, approached, uh, sources told me Jeff, Jeff approached uh, Luigi Minacchio at the time, the reputed boss, introduced himself and essentially said, how you doing? Um, Jeff Sillett, I'm going to put you in jail. Uh, mission accomplished for Jeffrey Sillett? So far. Yeah. You know? I mean, I think that was the word when he got here. I I'd heard that also, that right. he came here to kind of wipe out the mob in Rhode Island. Um, you know, I, I hear rumblings that, you know, Monaco is looking to get a plea deal where he can do five years. He's willing to do that. I, I can't imagine that the feds are going to make him an offer like that. Absolutely. I think not. he's 84 yeah. years old now, either 83 or 84. I know he's still in good physical condition, but I think they're, you know, I think it's doubtful that we're going to see him back on the street again. I'm hearing that he's uh, still, it, for people that don't know, I mean, he used to run around Triggs Golf Course. He's very active. Um, he used to go skiing a lot. I mean, not a drinker, not a very right. healthy guy. I heard he's still trying to remain healthy behind bars at this point. You're hearing the same thing. I, I hear he does a lot of chin-ups. 
That's why it's Yale and Sense for Flawless. <laughs> with, so. the, with the FBI, Jeff Solette came up from New York. He right. had a big. Uh, I know Jeff. He's yeah, he had a big role in uh, taking down one of the five families down there. Uh, but from your reporting, is there a stark contrast of the FBI pre Whitey and post Whitey? Well, I think in fairness to the FBI, that you know most of the people that are there now, they wouldn't even know who John Conley was. Sure. And that um, you know there was the FBI had great cases, you know, back in the 80s and the 90s, you know, against the New England yeah, mob. Loves, yeah, right. and and you know the state, the wave after wave. So a lot of that, though, thanks to Whitey Bulger. Uh, well, you know, that's been sort of over exaggerated. If you you know, once the FBI informant files were introduced in federal court, the guy who was really giving up the information was Stevie Fleming, mm. and um, another and right. another right. informant, right? They yeah. were they were sort of co you know partners. And that Whitey sort of was riding the coattails of. I mean, certainly Whitey did give up some information on the mafia, and, and, and but Whitey was never a trusted guy by the mafia. The one who had the trust of the mafia was Stevie Fleming. The uh, you know everyone uh, before he was picked up, uh, Whitey Bulger, would uh, ask me uh, or say to me in a statement, "The FBI doesn't really want to catch this guy." And I disagreed with that. As you point out, there was some new blood. Uh, in the Boston office, and I think they really wanted to catch this guy. And if it weren't going to be the FBI, the Mass State Police wanted him bad. Is that right? Well, I, I think that they they absolutely wanted to catch him. I think that there were some real mistakes made in the first two years that he went on the run. I mean, obviously, there, you know, there was the tip from John Conley to, to run, and there were all sorts of questions about how it was handled early on. But I think that once they created the task force in 97 to go after him, you know, the FBI was looking for him, the DEA and the state police who actually built the murder case, you know, against Bulger once he fled, they were looking for him. And they spent millions of dollars, and there were a lot of, you know, uh, aggressive people. But I think that once Whitey was outed as an informant in 1997, you know, in court, um, the Globe had reported in 88, but nobody really believed it. Uh, he was so bad, his own cohorts couldn't believe it. But I think that once he was outed, it, it changed everything, and it made it a lot harder for them to find him. I think he cut probably, what we, from what we know now, cut ties to back home. We, and we're running out of time, but I, I do want to get your opinion, whether or not you're going to offer it, and what you think the end game is on the Whitey Bulger case. How do you think this one's going to turn out? Well, I think that remains to be seen. I think sure. that clearly, um, you know, could he cut a deal? You know, will he go to trial? Those are sort of questions. I mean, I think that you have to say, well, what does he have to offer? Do people in Boston want him to go to trial? Uh, do you think they, they're hoping for that moment for the door to open so they can get more information and more truth uh, about this case, or do they just want it behind them? Well, I think the victims, you know, the, the families of the alleged victims, they want answers. They want to know, you know, what, what he can tell about certain things that happen. I mean, we've heard from, you know, um, Flemmy, who's in jail serving life, and, you know, Moderano, who's out, you know, and has written a book. We've heard from a lot of his former, you know, partners. But I, I think that if there was more that happened or another side of it, they want to hear it. Um, but what they really want is why you spend the rest of his life in jail. Hmm. All right. Well, I want to thank you. Shelley Murphy from the Boston Globe, thanks for taking the time with us. And, of course, Bill, Bill Malinowski from the Providence Shame. Journal. Thank you for watching. If you missed any of Newsmakers, be sure to catch it on our website, which you're on right now, WPRI.com. It's under the On Air section. Just click on Newsmakers. And we will see you next week on Newsmakers. Good job.